So uh, with that, let's go ahead and start. Uh, our first uh, speaker today is John Crook from Yesu. He's been licensed since the mid 90s in Northern Wisconsin and received the call uh, N9 UPC as the luck of the draw. His love and passion for radio started him working in two-way radio in 1999. In addition to the passion for amateur radio, John has worked in law enforcement, fire, and is still a community critical care paramedic. Prior to working with Yesu, John worked in public safety communications, dealing with the P25, APCO 25 trunking, paging, and simulcast systems. John has personally designed and installed numerous paging, trunking, and public safety systems. John is trained as a FEMA COML, COMT, and OXCOM, along with volunteering numerous hours, worked at local events requiring emergency communications and vital comms. He also serves as the Aries Races EC for St. Croix County and is the trustee and owner of 13 DR repeaters, imagine that. Uh, in which will be expanding to a total of 14 this year. He also has experience in FM, C4FM, P25 Infusion, uh, DMR, NXDN, and POCSEG paging. Uh, don't let John's title as National Sales Manager Fusion, Fusion Specialist fool you. He's helped and planned the design of numerous amateur setups for customers and fellow amateurs. And with that, I hope you all welcome uh, John Crook. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, let me see and make sure everybody can see my screen here, okay? Is everybody able to see that? It looks perfect here and we'll see it on YouTube shortly. Okay, perfect. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Um, as stated, uh, my name is John Crook. My call is N9 UPC. Um, I, I first of all, I want to uh, thank the MicroHams for going ahead and allowing me to pre present here. Um, I actually like to do these kind of, uh, I normally do webinars actually for clubs and groups and presentations uh, in addition to actually going out and doing them in, in the real world field here. But uh, one of the things that I actually like about this here is, is that um, when I get to do these more special events, I can actually get, as I like to call it, a little bit granular. So today's not going to be a horse and pony show in any way, shape, or form. That's why I've entitled today's presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, Ones and Zeros of Yezu System Fusion. So um, basically I wanted to touch on, because a lot of people tend to have questions about fusion, about um, certain aspects of it, you know, why we did what we did or why we do what we do as Yezu on there. So I thought this might be kind of a good um, one to kind of overview, kind of give you an idea where we came from, kind of why we did what we did, and then um, kind of explain some of the things there. And then by all means, if we still have time in this session here, or definitely if not, I will go over to the breakout room there and answer more questions if they are technical in nature, those kind of things like that on there. So um, I'm just going to skip this slide. It's uh, basically kind of what um, uh, Scott already kind of went over on there. But the first one here is called C4FM and Start a Fusion. And I want to take you, as I joke around saying, Sophia from the Golden Girls, picture it, 2013. And what happened is, is that we actually released a product to uh, the amateur market, which was known as C4FM, Digital Voice Technology for Amateurs. However, right away, we noticed there was something about it, which is um, we wanted to call it a different name. And the reason why we wanted to call it name was we called it Yezu System Fusion. And the reason that we did is, is because of what the capabilities and what we wanted to be able to do for it. So first of all, it was a new type of digital voice communications uh, for amateur radio that was released. And we want to stress that it was for amateur radio, because if you look at other digital voice communications out there, you're going to go to notice that what tends to happen a lot with it is, is that they are LMR public safety based that are converted over to be used in an amateur radio world. Well, the issue with that is, is you run into sometimes IDing issues, the capability issues, those kind of things like that on there. So that's where it was designed to be amateur radio. And that's why you notice that um, where ours is different than, let's say, and I'll use an example like DMR, P25, Next End, those kind of things like that, is because um, you can actually put your call sign in the header. It's not a numerical number like some of the other things. Is. That was one of the big things that was designed for there. But even still more so, when you started to get actually look at it, um, it it really kind of boiled down to saying, okay, here's the deal. It uh, does have high quality digital voice. It does have ease of use and operations, versatility and flexibility. Now, one of the things that people went along and instantly said on there was, is when we get this a lot, is that it was proprietary in nature. Actually, wrong. It is not. It is not proprietary in nature. And I'll even prove it to you how it's not. If you actually go to our Yezu website, you can actually find the complete white paper that we issued and published on Yezu System Fusion 
that allows you to actually see what the C4 FM frequencies are, what those kind of things are. So we were doing this. Yes. Was it designed and created in-house? Yes, of course it was. I mean, everything was in to, to some sort of degree. But what we did is we did allow it to people to do that. And if you take a look, there are other third-party products not made by Yezu that do use and incorporate Yezu System Fusion. So if it was a proprietary thing, those things would not be happening out on the market there today. So what did it consist of? It consisted basically start out with initially at first handhelds and mobiles for simplex operation. But obviously simplex operation only goes so far. You need a infrastructure network to be put into place. And that's where the repeaters came in. And the repeaters were initially designed to be standalone operation and not designed to require the internet for linking or anything like that. It was just, you know, basically, hey, you wanted to put up a repeater, you wanted to have a, a digital voice repeater, but you didn't necessarily want to go ahead and link out or anything like that. It would faci facilitate, it would meet those needs. You, it was very easy. And once again, that flexibility and versatility. It was also a creation at that same time when it was first released for the ability to people talk and link to one another if you chose to do so. So if you think about it as a hierarchy structure, you have a user level, you have an infrastructure level, and you have a networking level. And those are all key points in how the system can be developed and how the system can be used. Because we didn't want to lock people into a situation of saying, well, okay, if I want to really experience it, I need to keep connected to the internet, those kind of things like that. I can speak from personal experience here in northern Wisconsin. The internet doesn't go places. Um, there are places where um, many times you will travel and there is no um, cell service whatsoever. The internet is um, just a smidge faster than dial-up. So having those aspects of things was really kind of detrimental. We required it to be there. So Fusion actually operates in four modes. The mode that's not listed on the screen here is actually the FM mode. Now, FM is standard in all theirs. We, we're, we, we didn't build any sort of digital-only type device, I, I, any sort of things like that whatsoever. We wanted to always have FM capability, hence why we call it Yezu System Fusion. We, the Fusion word is actually the fusing of analog and digital together, and I'll explain that in a little bit here. But you actually have, because we use C4FM, uh, because we used FDMA technology, what we're allowed to do is, is and for those of you that are aware of it, um, or maybe not aware of it, FDMA basically, and I use the example of is, is a roadway, all right? And if you think of it as a roadway, what we do is normally uh, think of a two-lane road, you know, your normal, you know, road that you, city street, you drive down, those kind of things like that. Well, what happens is, is that if you have uh, that roadway in place, what C4FM is, is it may be one lane going north, one lane going south, but C4FM with FDMA technology, frequency division type of technology, which FDMA is, what we can do is we can actually slice those lanes further down and make it more granular. So a two lane could become a four lane or four lane might be able to come an eight lane, those kind of things like that on there. That really played into a couple of different things of why we chose that, you know, because people say, well, why didn't you choose TDMA? Why don't you do this and this and this? Well, at the time Fusion was released, we looked at what was out there for the ability to do um, amplifiers, to do those kind of things like that. And we found out that FDMA was more user-friendly than it was TDMA because TDMA was, you know, uh, timed. So it's, you know, on and off, keying on and off, keying on and off, you know, about like 30 milliseconds, that kind of thing like that on there. So we found out that amplification, other things like that on there. Um, it, and it, it really, really kind of boiled down to that where it was like, man, we're, we're really having difficulty trying to find stuff that would be there. Because if you take a handheld for an example, which I've done in the past and you needed to have a, you know, an amplifier on, I want to take my handheld from five to, to 50 watts, those kind of things like that on there, then guess what? You needed to go ahead and you needed to, you know, get an amplifier. And if it was a TDMA, probably wasn't going to be able to find an amplifier. But if you did an FDMA, you could use a regular amplifier on there. So um, we did digital narrow. So that was the first one. Digital narrow we run on, if you look on the graph here, it's going to show the blue, or excuse me, purple side is going to be your digital voice. So it is compressed down to 6.25 kilohertz for bandwidth. Now on that other 6.25 kilohertz of bandwidth to give you a total of 12.5, we run data, forward air correction. So if you ever use Fusion and you're using a DN, that's where you're going to get your GPS. That's where you're going to get your call sign routing. That's where you're going to get forward air correction. And, and you'll notice DN compared to VW mode, and DN stands for digital narrow, by the way. Um, you're going you're gonna to get maybe just a little bit better range on there because of that forward air correction. Now, the other mode that was on there or we used is what we call VW mode. Now, VW stands for voice wide mode. So if you look at the graph, you're going to see 
that 12.5 kilohertz bandwidth is taken up completely by voice. There's no forward air correction. There's no nothing on there. There is the call sign that is passed because the call sign is part of the data heading or the header of the, the transmission in there. So that's why you always will see a call sign. But on voice wide, you don't necessarily get the GPS information. You don't necessarily get that forward air correction on there. Now, one other thing that we did add is we added a mode called DW. DW stands for data wide. And what we do is instead of having 12.5 kilohertz of voice, we have 12.5 kilohertz of data. Now, data wide is, is no, and we, we, I know we hear a lot of complaints about it. And that's the saying, hey, wait a minute here. We, when can we access data wide? Well, we can't. Um, data wide is accessed through certain parts of the protocol only. So if you're sending a text message, if you're sending a picture message, more importantly, a lot of later stuff, when you're, when you're syncing with the wires X or handshaking with the wires X device, or you are actually sending fusion telecommands like up through the repeater, that's when you're going to go ahead and utilize the data wide mode on there. So another thing about fusion is fusion can transcode and it's really the only digital voice mode out there that allows you to transcode without additional kind of equipment on there. And what I mean by transcoding is, is that you can, with our repeaters, our wires X, um, the technology built into that, you can actually have a digital signal come into the repeater, and then the repeater can be set up to transcode it and put it out as FM only. Vice versa, FM can come in, um, digital can come out. Um, and then you have higher tiers too, where it could be digital and analog coming in and then forced to go FM out or digital analog coming in forced to go digital out or finally going ahead and um, having digital come in, digital go out, analog come in or FM come in and FM comes out. That's what we call AMS mode. Okay. Um, but it's not only the repeater level. Like I said, it is wires X wires X is this, the networking layer. And, and to give you a quick history on wires X, if you had wires two. Wires 2 was the foundation of Wires X. And what Wires 2 did was it allowed you to take analog um, uh, stations, come in, whether it be control stations, as I sometimes call it, or donor radios, um, sometimes referred to as, or connect directly to repeater and connect to other ones. Wires X is kind of that same thing on there, but the twist, the caveat onto it was, is now you could operate it in just strictly digital, or you can, once again, do the transcoding through the wires X network, meaning one node can come in on digital and it can go out to an FM node or an F or, or you know, however, however you wanted to set it up. That's how wires X also does transcoding. So a lot of people ask, well, why did you use C4FM? Why didn't you use someone else's technology or something like that on there? So the reason we use C4FM is because one, it, it had been around since the mid 1990s for a digital voice mode. Uh, public safety had been using it for a while. Uh, if uh, you take a look at, you know, actually from the US, I don't know if other um, people are from outside of the US are attending or not, but APCO 25 is a standard also known as P25. It sets a standard of using C4FM and using FDMA. Um, now with that kind of perfection that, that has been done with C4FM with FDMA, it really kind of set the groundwork for saying, here's how you can have high quality digital voice. Here's how the, it would operate um, in, in principle and fundamental um, aspects. So that's why um, we looked at use C4FM um, and FDMA combination. Now, four people say, um, why, why, why didn't you go ahead and why didn't you just use P25? Well, we're not stupid, okay? Contrary to what some customers may believe, we are not stupid. And we knew if we made a P25 radio, I can guarantee you hands down that by the time that someone would walk into one of our dealers, purchase a C4 FM radio, they probably would not even be back fully to their car and they would have already modified it to try to talk and use it on public safety systems or systems that we probably shouldn't be operating on with an amateur radio or we probably shouldn't be on at all. So that's why we did it differently. But also too, is if you look at the P25 standard, that kind of thing didn't have that call sign in there, it has a number. So that's why we had to change it a little bit on there. But C4FM also offers that flexibility to be able to hop in between 12.5 kilohertz and 6.25 kilohertz with just a push of a button. Now, yes, there are other technologies that are out there now that did this, but you have to remember when concept of creation came out, we're talking actually 2010 is when it did um, get, get first kind of thought of and started to be, um, you know, come to fruition and stuff. And it wasn't fully released until 2013. So other modes that are out there, which can sort of do the same thing, were really non-existent at that time. All right, so using C4FM also. Once again, why? 
it offers a better, higher quality audio that we wanted to do for GMSK. For that was that was a current one that was out there was used a lot. GMSK. I personally in the radio field, I used GMSK on um, some other type of business system, some trunk system, some some glad like that um, aspects of it on there. It, it just it the audio quality wasn't there. Um, there were other alternatives that were felt that were better issues, better um, better solve uh, solutions, I should say, that solved audio issues. So that's why we chose C4FM. Uh, once again, flexibility and expansion. Um, C4FM allowed us to really kind of change and tweak things. And then the other thing we noticed is it did have a higher bit rate on there. And then when we're looking at higher bit rates, um, you, you have a little bit more room to play with in the data of, of the protocol of, of moving things back and forth between there. Whereas if you have a slower baud rate, that's when you're going to start to experience possible audio quality issues, possible flexibility issues, those kind of things. So all, all in essence, the 9600 baud with the C4FM FDMA really worked out really good. Um, so let's talk about ways to communicate. Uh, ways to communicate with Fusion um, are, are a couple of them. So first of all, you have a repeater. This is simple, 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 simple picture of a repeater. Obviously, one user comes in, talks into the repeater, and then it repeats it out. Um, this picture is from our DR2X uh, 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 repeater manual kind of um, uh, brochure on there. And what it does show is that the, the DR2X has some special features of functionality in there. But this is the basic concept of it. It's, it's a repeater. Go in, go out. Um, the one other thing that we were able to do with our repeater and our infrastructure is, is that um, we really wanted to allow people to take advantage of the VHF and UHF bands. So that's where another part of the fusion aspect came into play. Not only did we try to make sure that we had this, uh, con how do I say this, it's conversion or um, connection between analog and digital, but with the repeaters, we wanted to also make it a understanding of versatility in the field of saying you can receive on VHF and transmit on UHF, or you can receive um, you know, on, on UHF and transmit on VHF. So you had, had that flexibility across the board there. And in addition, you could, once again, overlay or overlap how you wanted to do it. Do you want to come in digital? Do you want to go out analog? Those kind of things like that on there. However, one big thing that I think is very important is, is that we also saw where things could happen with the repeaters. And I, and I bring this up because a lot of people ask the question, why don't you have a crossband repeater like for the mobiles or stuff like that on there? The reason that we don't have that is because... If you think about how digital works, digital comes in, you, you, you put your analog voice into something, it goes into the vocoder, it, in, it encodes it into the um, technology you're using, sends it out over the air. Then the receiving radio receives it, unpacks it, or, or decodes it through the vocoder, and then puts it out to the speaker. Well, if you do that with the repeater, you're going to be going hopping, 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 and then eventually, within even just one hop, you're going to go ahead and have the degrading of audio quality and it's not going to be viable in any way, shape or form. And if you, and some people say, well, no, 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 it's not possible. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, if you, if you take a digital signal, put it in something that receives a digital signal, which decodes it, puts it back into a digital signal and sends it out again to something that does it, you're going to lose fidelity because you're, you're basically making a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. So that's one of the things that the repeater cannot do. However, one of the things that we, you know, we said, okay, I can see there's this issue is, is we made the repeaters capable of crossband. So that's obviously one way to do it. Second way to communicate would be using the WireZX software. Now, WireZX was initially designed to be a node-to-node -node type situation or a node-to-a-room type situation. For people who are unfamiliar with that or what we exactly mean by that, um, and you might date yourself if you know, go back to the days of AOL, you know, you've got mail, okay, kind of things. You, you had that, that instant messenger, which was one-to-one, -one, or you had the chat room, which is one-to-many. WiresX was designed that way. But the best part about it is, is that you have a situation is you, you, you really kind of, not, not all repeaters were available around the world. There were some areas of the country, or countries, I should say, that did not allow fusion repeaters. So what ended up happening in that case is, is that you were able to then go ahead and take and let people who wanted to experience fusion but couldn't do a repeater, were not allowed to do a repeater, and to be able to connect those two together. Okay, so what basically happens in that case is, is that you could take a, uh, a node, set it up in one place, and then you can connect to your friend, and then you, you have basically, you've created a connection between the two. 
As a matter of fact, what some people also did is they put up ad hoc repeaters, almost like some people call it a split site repeater kind of thing, where you have one site on one frequency and then maybe a mile or two or something or however further away or something like that, they could actually put up another node and then they could put it on a frequency, let's say if it was VHF, 600 kilohertz away. And then what you could do is you can actually set your radio up to act like a repeater. But what would happen is you'd transmit into one site and then you would receive your radio off of another site. So that's what WiresX did. And th this is basically the device that is needed on there. Now, there has been a change to WiresX. And the, the, the thing that has changed the most on WiresX is, is that now we've actually allowed it to be a little more flexible and you don't need an HRI 200 anymore. You can actually use a device that connects into there. Now, the concept behind that is, is what is coming up next year which goes into our hybrid. So um, let's do IMRS first, and then we'll explain how the hybrid is. So with IMRS, what you had is, is you had people that said, I want to be able to connect my repeaters together, but I do not want to use wires X. I don't want to use the internet whatsoever. I have either an intranet link or some people have used um, ham mesh or Arden or, or a tunneling or VPN server or something like that on there that they did not want to have to use the, the traditional quote unquote internet. IMRS allowed you to do that in digital voice. And this allowed a true digital voice, okay? Um, and that basically allowed you to say, hey, I have two repeaters that are connected together. Whether they're locally, whether they're far apart, whatever, 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 it, it's gonna allow you to do that. Now, that in essence gives you true digital voice because you don't have to run through a server. You don't have to run through a bridge connection. You don't have to do anything. As long as the IP address out of one of the um, repeaters on the IMRS board can see the other repeater on the IMS board, then it allows you to go ahead and facilitate a communication that takes place on there. And I know that there's been people that have actually started to do different types of things with IMRS um, that have really kind of started to create these, what I kind of call a network of networks. Um, I hear from people all the time that said, it's great because I can have my three or four repeaters serving my county, my home, my town, anything like that. But then what ends up happening is, is people go ahead and saying, but when I want to connect via a different um, a group of repeaters, we simply key up and, and we can go back from there. And this is what the IMRS board looks like. It's a tiny little board that fits into the uh, back of the repeater. And as you see there, it has an ethernet connection on there. That ethernet connection um, then basically takes in whatever you need for a connection. So it could be, you know, um, an RJ45 jack for connecting, you know, once again, a cable to a switch that goes in the other repeater, goes out to the internet, whatever you need to do, as long as you have the IP address of the other repeater, the other location, you can program it up and use this board. Now, this is where I talk about the hybrid thing. Now, the hybrid thing was actually created, and I kind of actually fell into this category a lot myself, is, is that when I was traveling and I'd go to the office, what would end up happening is, is that there would be times and situations where I wanted to talk back to my Wires X node uh, back in Wisconsin. Well, guess what? I wasn't able to do so because if with the HRI 200, yes, you do have to open up ports. You do have to do a couple things because of the capabilities of the HRI 200. So realistically, if you want to scare the hotel or have them put you on some sort of secret watch list, call down to the front desk and saying, listen, hi, I'm in room 402. I need you to go ahead and give me a, a non-natted uh, global IP address, and I need you to open up the following ports to my room here, please. Well, that kind of does raise some concerns and um, gets you the manager of the hotel to come knocking on your door to find out what's going on. So what we did is, is with the HRI 200, or excuse me, HRI or PDN modes is what we came out with. It allows you to do what's on the picture here, which is to take a handheld device and, or a mobile device and connect it physically to the computer. And there you can use the microphone or the speaker, or you can use another radio to talk to it and then talk back to your Wires X node at home or a Wires X room. From there, you can see that it actually um, go, it can actually broadcast out then into like if you have an IMRS network or stuff like that on there. So in that case, what ends up happening is, is now you're able to, in essence, call home. And now I can access my local repeater network. I can access my local WiresX node by using WiresX in that case there. And this is basically what it is. It's just a combination of the HRI 200 and the IMRS board that needs to be linked together. So that's it for my presentation. Um, I, I, I'm sure people have questions on there. So that's why I kind of made it a, a little bit um, short here. 
Uh, and I guess, um, Scott, I guess I'll turn it back over to you to see if you um, have any sort of, um, anybody has any questions or anything like that on there. Uh, so the one question I got is, and I think, uh, yeah, it's not quite clear here. It says, what's the physical link for IRMS? The internet, I suspect it's the only real choice. So it sounded like, it looked like, well, you mentioned the internet or uh, some kind of, uh, some other type of network infrastructure. Is that correct? Yeah, basically the, the easiest way to describe IRMS is you need that IP data to go from repeater A to repeater B or repeater A to the multiple repeaters. So what I've done myself, for an example, is, is um, I've had mine in my house here. I have mine on, on a switch um, or at the tower side, I should say, I have it on a switch where if someone comes in VHF, they, it goes into a switch and then it connects over to the UHF repeater and then it's done locally. Um, I know other people have actually put it on an intranet. Um, they've actually hopped on a microwave network owned by the county uh, because it doesn't go out and touch the internet. So basically, whatever you got to do to get IP traffic from point A to point B, you can do that. Um, the personal um, experience, one that I've done myself, is, is I actually did a bunch of hops. So I went from my, my internet connection at my house here, then went via actually ham mesh to my um, site. Well, actually, let me, let me put it in reverse. The repeater came via a ham mesh to my house here. That then hopped on a VPN tunnel. That VPN tunnel, of course, went by the internet. It went out to up by my dad's house there um, where the other repeater was um, located close by. That actually then hopped on another ham mesh network that ran up to the tower site. And then from there, the packets were routed and everything like that because I have All-Star and other things out there. Um, that Those packets were directly routed to the actual repeater itself. So really, as long as you can get all that IP data traffic from point A to point B, doesn't matter how it goes. Uh, so d does it, um, I guess, so you don't actually need, there, it's not consuming any or attaching to any resource that's internet based, then it really is, could be self-contained. This Correct. network could be entirely self-contained. Correct. Okay. Um, so I do have another question here. It says, uh, ask John to address the question of whether or not the voice codec is proprietary or not. I think his statements regarding the proprietary claims were not fully honest. Uh, that's You've a good this. question. So um, we get that a lot. So um, no vocoder um, out there is, uh, it, in essence, we wanted to say it, we can say all vocoders are proprietary because all vocoders are made by DVSI. They have a patent on all the vocoders. They have the patent on the AMBE plus two, they have the AMB two, the IMBE and everything like that. So if you want a vocoder, you have to go through DVSI. But um, the protocol that is put on the vocoder, so whether you're using C4FM as in a P25, whether you're using Yezu System Fusion, whether you're using DMR, that protocol is then loaded onto that vocoder. So no, you could go ahead and you can make any sort of, um, uh, if you make a software vocoding, those kind of things like that on there, it is, it is totally possible to do on there. So, um, and like I said, our paper is actually on our Yezu website. If you go under the actual, I think as you go to yezu.com, go under products, go under digital, and you look under file sections of the FT2, um, you will see that there's a white paper there. And it gives you all of the data that you need um, to go ahead and know how Fusion operates and stuff. And once again, um, you know, I, I, make the, I make the claim and I make the statement on there, you know, there are other devices out there that are not Yezu made that can process and use Yezu System Fusion. So, Let's think about it, folks. I'll be honest with you. If it was proprietary, people would be people would have to pay us for it. Okay, that's that's how proprietary works. If you want it, you have to pay for it. That's in essence the addition of um, of proprietary. People aren't paying us for that, so people are using the Fusion protocol, and it's not proprietary on there. So uh, you mentioned the the IMRS board mm -hmm. um, that goes into you said it goes into the repeater, correct? That is correct. And does that go into the, what is it, the DR1X and the DR2X? Are those the two repeaters? No, it only goes into the DR2X. The okay. DR1X is no longer in production on there. And that was one of the things that when we made the DR2X from the DR1X, we looked at what a list of people wanted for, for updates. If we were able to do facilitate the updates, we did that through firmware. That's why there was a lot of firmware updates on the DR1X series. However, there were physical limitations, what people wanted. People wanted a true digital voice linking. So that's where only the IMRS works in the DR2X. Got it. Okay, that was my question. Back to these questions. Uh, is the new repeater, I assume that's the DR2X, 100% duty cycle? 
We don't go by duty cycle. That's um, what a lot of people go ahead and say is, is that um, uh, basically it, it, we go by, the easiest way to describe is we go by 140 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which means that we, we do our internal PA temperature at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If that PA temperature goes any higher than 140 degrees Fahrenheit, what will end up happening is the repeater actually will go ahead and shut down to the next power level. So if you're running at 50 watts, it will go back down to 20 watts. If you're at 20 watts, it will go back down to five watts. And then as I said, if it goes back down to five watts, um, it will, it will, it will, you know, there's, there's problems, <laughs> you know what I mean, on there. But in that case, yes. Um, and we've done it in the California sun. We've taken the repeater out in the parking lot. We've opened up the lid on a warm day. We basically turned off the timeout timer on there. We put um, different radios on there and just let the brick go. And we took, you know, the, the, the floor meter on there and we were watching it. And as soon as it hit 140 degrees and was staying there, then boom, it automatically shut back down the power level on there. So um, that if that is 100 duty percent, 100 percent duty cycle in their minds, I guess that's that's up to interpretation. So it certainly say it indicates it's safe to let it run at its highest power level. You guys have these power down modes that correct that allow uh, safe operation. Got it. Correct. Um, how is contention handled? First come, first serve, or is there a priority or break in functionality? For for which one, sir? Um, I assume this is over the link versus local. I think those are the those are the cases that I've seen in the past with linked systems. How do you gotcha. handle contention? Gotcha. Yeah, there is there is somewhat of a priority aspect on there, and it really kind of comes down to how you are going to map out your system. And that's that's what I that's what I tell people on there is is you really have to kind of lap map out. There are timers that are involved to give you priority versus non-priority. There is an A and a B side to the DR2X. So in that regards, in that case, you can go ahead and someone can come in on the A side, someone can come in on the B side. That's where you would go ahead and select your priority on there. So there are a couple different options. So it really I guess boils down to to saying how how does it play to all together. Right. Uh, that is the last question I have currently, and um, I guess we'll, if you're willing to hang out, it sounds like you were willing to hang out for a little longer in the breakout room. Yes. Uh, I would invite people over there. We should have the, uh, the URL for the breakout, you should already have the URL for the breakout room, and uh, the people in the YouTube channel should be getting it in their chat window right now, correct, Kenny? He's delayed, so it'll take a while. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions. I appreciate the the all the presentation. Uh, is it possible for us to put you on the spot here? Uh, I was going to send you an email about getting a copy of it. Is that an option? That we could yeah, we, we can we can we can take a look at getting something over to you. All right, that'd be fantastic. Thank you very much again, John. And uh, I think we're going to get ready to. Uh, queue up the next person and we've got some information that we can put online. Thanks.